promise of the banking union was laid out pretty well by, um, uh, by Martin at the beginning. Uh, the official rhetoric is that the banking union is about um, uh, ending the wave of uh, costly uh, bailouts of, of, of big banks. And if you look at the numbers, uh, this is no small issue. Over the past uh, five years, according to, uh, to the Commission, 1.7 trillion euro has been spent bailing out banks. And uh, I think it's about three times that amount has, been, um, has actually been, um, uh, been, been put up as, uh, as guarantees. Um, but about the banking union, is that, is that the remedy? Is that uh, the antidote to, uh, to future bailouts? I, I doubt that very much. And um, I, will, uh, I will make my case um, uh, through uh, six, six separate points. The first is, is there any reason to believe that the European Central Bank is any better than national supervisors? Um, it, I mean, it is a fact that uh, in, during the financial crisis it was pretty clear that uh, some regulators really, um, um, really um, did not live up to their responsibilities such as uh, the FSA in the UK and the whole affair on, on uh, Northern Rock. Uh, clearly an example of a regulator that, that preferred to turn, uh, turn the blind eye. Uh, so there is, I mean, there is a case for um, uh, criticizing national regulators. The question here though should be, why would we expect something completely different from the European Central Bank? Is it that the European Central Bank is not close to banks? I can mention a few people pretty high up in the European Central Bank that are very, very close to some of the very, very biggest banks in, uh, in the world. Um, there were also, there was an episode only last year uh, when the European Central Bank deliberately chose to look the other way when a big bank in Cyprus, uh, a Nike Bank, was in trouble and kept on pouring money, public money, into, into Nike Bank in the act actually breaching its own rules. That's an ongoing discussion at, 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 with the council at the moment, what, had, what happened there. So why would the ECB actually be any different? Second point, the European Central Bank is uh, opaque and it's not accountable to anybody. If, you, um, if, you look at, uh, if you're looking for precise information on the uh, operation of the bank, or if you're looking for precise information on decision making, decision processes, debates in the, uh, in the governing council of the ECB, mostly you will run your head against the wall and get, and get nothing. Uh, also, it's, it's, as most will know, it's actually the first commandment of uh, the European Central Bank that it is supposed to be independent from any kind of, of political body. So in terms of accountability, what do we get from the banking union? We get meetings with the European Parliament. Meetings. And at those meetings, uh, parliamentarians can complain over this and that, and they can criticize the bank heavily, and the bank can say, yes, but I'm sorry, but we're the ones with the shoes on. Uh, and it can have absolutely no effect. That's if, I've heard that several times, be uh, the prime example of the accountability of, of the banking union. I think that's uh, that's uh, that's a scam. Much more, not much more. Than that. Third, and I'm going to uh, spend some time on the actual rules on banking regulation. So far, what we've discussed is mostly supervision. I think it's very very important that we take as a starting point that supervision is a very interesting subject. But if the rules are flawed. What is uh, super supervision worth? And my third po first point is that um, we have a problem with the requirements that banks are faced with at the moment. The, the, the capital, so-called uh, capital requirements are not particularly high. Um, uh, capital requirements, I should say. That. You could say that's uh, the reserves that banks are compelled to have at their, at their disposal. The uh, capital requirements were increased recently. Um, um, the, uh, there was a directive under regulation finally adopted a couple of months ago. It's been on its way for, I think, three years, two or three years. 
And even though the requirements have, were increased, if you look at the literature, uh, you would find, um, you would find uh, many analysts who would claim that the, the requirements are either maybe 50% below the size they should be on some accounts, even, even, uh, even much, uh, much lower. And this is very much a result from, uh, uh, of um, the um, systematic work of the International uh, Banking Lobby a couple of years ago when there was a struggle at the international level about um, the, uh, uh, the amount of uh, capital that was to be required by banks. And the banks basically um, uh, left the, so the Basel negotiations as, as the victors. That was some years ago and we see the consequences in European legislation at the moment. So that was my third point, low capital requirements. Fourth, the banking union is not just about financial stability. There are other concerns that play a very, very important role in there. And one important one is that it's very much about the single market. Actually, very often when you hear the European Central Bank talk about banking union, they forget about financial stability. They forget about the question of resilience of banks. And they focus mainly on the, the role that the banking union can play in uh, strengthening the, uh, uh, the, the single market. Now, what, what are the consequences? One very important consequence is that um, um, when it was discussed at the Commission how to react to uh, international guidelines on capital requirements, they made a very interesting uh, decision. Um, from the international level, from the Basel agreements, they got an, uh, um, uh, suggestions for capital requirements that were supposed to be minimum requirements. Minimum requirements, they felt that the Commission, and definitely in the banking world as well, minimum requirements is a pain in the ass if what you want to do is create a single market. So, in the European legislation, the European diluted version of the international rules, they have been almost turned on its head. So now it is actually in, in, in European legislation, they function more as maximum requirements. Which means that actually a member state would be able to have stronger banking regulation if they were not uh, part of the European Union, if they were not uh, inside the uh, the banking union. Um, so, I can't, and a thing like that has nothing to do with considerations on uh, financial stability. This is about the, the, the single market, and it's stressed all the time by by the European Central Bank. The fifth point: this whole exercise, these new rules on uh, on capital requirements, is undermined by the space provided for self-regulation of banks. Again, the capital requirements. The rules say, for instance, you have to have 7-8% uh, of uh, your assets uh, as, uh, as, as reserve capital. Uh, in the Act, um, um, banks have a very, very big leeway to determine the amount they have to have at their disposal. How does that work? To put it briefly, Banks are allowed to assess the value of their own assets, the riskiness of their own assets, and uh, um, with the use of uh, very advanced uh, internal ratings models. After that, they can, uh, when they have determined the, uh, the value of their own assets, that number in turn determines the capital requirements. To give you one example of what this kind of internal uh, internal modeling can do. A couple of months ago it was revealed that due to uh, creative internal modeling of British banks they were actually 50 billion euro, 50 billion pounds short in capital requirements. Another example, only last year, end of last year, uh, Deutsche Bank was in trouble because their capital requirements were a bit uh, on the low side. What they did was uh, mainly adjust their internal models and change their, in that way they changed their uh, balance sheets to the sound of 26 billion euros. 
just by adjusting their internal assessment of their own assets. This system is, uh, of, of internal modeling. modeling is something that was inherited from the time uh, before the financial crisis. During the financial crisis, it was flatly admitted, even by people who had uh, written the rules, that this system would have to be fundamentally reformed. What we saw uh, with the financial crisis what not, was not just a failure of supervision. First and foremost, it was a failure of, of the rules. The rules were flawed. Uh, supervision came in, uh, in second. Six, because of this, because of these uh, uh, weak rules on banking regulation, I don't see why we should see uh, the banking union as an antidote to cost and bailouts in the future. If the banking union is about having the ECB watching over banks, uh, it would be to little effect if the rules themselves are, uh, are flawed. And when it comes to resolution, um, I think it's pretty clear from the negotiations that uh, while the financial sector is supposed to contribute a bit in the future to, uh, to resolution, it will mainly, as I understand it, be public money that will be would be a plane. I, for instance, I find it extremely worrying when we, when in the documents of the Commission, you see uh, the new directive as, as uh, a kind of an, um, a counter move to uh, what, for instance, the Icelandic government did. Iceland is highlighted in the Commission documents as an example of what we should avoid in the future. What did Iceland do? They allowed, uh, they allowed the banks to fail, and they refused to let the Icelandic people pay, uh, pay the price. So generally, I think we should not lure ourselves into believing that the banking union is about is just about put, uh, financial stability and about putting an effective stop to irresponsible uh, banking. I think there are many other things at, at play in, in the banking union project, uh, many of which are pretty really